Father, we thank you for your word, your truth. We thank you for the ministry of your spirit. We thank you for accomplishing your purpose tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, may our hearts be enlarged that we might run the way of your commandment. We thank you that your word has come to exhort, to lift us up, to comfort, to strengthen, to educate our minds and our thinking, so that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto every good work. So we receive with joy, we receive with understanding, and we will guard our heart to make sure that we are not offended, and we will guard our heart to make sure that none of the, 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 the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, or any of those other things don't get in and choke the word. So that the word of God that is delivered tonight enters into our heart, finds a home in our heart, and it brings forth a harvest, and the kingdom of God is not is not stifled, it's not limited, it's not choked, but we believe that for you to who are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ever ask or think in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, that's a good word to start with. The new man that God has designed and created, he in and of himself is good soil. He's perfect soil for a hundredfold. The problem is, however, when we allow the cares of this world, the deceitful riches, the lust of other things, and in the trials and tribulations and that the enemy brings along to cause us to become offend, offended, when we allow ourselves to be offended or allow, or allow the word to be choked, then the kingdom of God, which in and of itself is not limited, but when we allow that choking to take place, then it is limited in its functioning through us. Amen? And, 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 um, and the life of Christ that is in us is somewhat choked. Therefore, when we recognize that, we also recognize that our responsibility is to make sure it's not choked and it's to make sure that we don't get offended. Receiving the word is not too hard. Receiving it with joy is reasonably easy. And I'll tell you why. The Bible says a man has joy by the answer of his mouth. Proverbs 16, 15, 23. You could be facing a situation and, ask, and someone says the right thing, the right thing to you, and you could get somebody to laugh and smile even in the midst of misery. Isn't that right? Yeah. Well, if man's word can do that, how much more does the word of God have the ability to bring joy? Amen? So receiving the word and receiving the word with joy is not difficult. You could almost say it's a no-brainer. It's easy. The problem is, they receive the word, they receive the word with joy, but afterwards, when trial and affliction and pressure came, for the word's sake, what happened? They stumbled, they, they got offended, and they pulled back. Now, what do you mean they got offended? They got offended, how did that offense manifest? And I'll tell you how it, got manif how it manifested. Even to tell you how it's manifested, it could offend you. <laughs> Amen. How it got man, how that offense became manifested after they received the word with joy is that when the pressure come, then their thinking turned instead of looking outward how they can bless, how they can give, what God can do through them. All of a sudden, their thinking turned around, and then it's what about me? It's but I'm getting hurt. I could be wounded. I can die. And the, and that inward that 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 ingrown toenail type thinking. <laughs> that, 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 that there, I got to look out for number one. If I don't, who will? That, that thinking from that mindset is what created the offense. Does that offend you? <laughs> All right. So it tells you then that to not be offended, you cannot allow that. And that, in fact, that's one of the dynamic things about the new man. The new man in and of himself is not self-centered. Because he is so perfectly designed by God that he has God's divine nature. And his meat is to do the will of the Father. He is far more concerned, uh, he is far more concerned about your progress than his. In fact, he is not even looking at himself as much as because he's in a place of knowing. Amen? He is looking and, and he's more concerned about the purpose of God being accomplished in your life. Because as for him, he figures he is in the purpose of God. And he doesn't see anything thing else. He doesn't see any deviation from that. You see, he is very rooted and grounded. 
He, he is a partake of the divine nature. And that's the very essence of that nature. Where his meat is to do the will of the Father. Where, um, the, you know, the Bible says, where he does not live the rest of his life for the will of men, but for the will of God. He, he, is, he knows the reality of the fact that it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that liveth in me. He knows the reality of the fact that, that, that I'm dead to the world. And now that I live, I live but unto God. So with, with that kind of mindset, he is not considering his own loss and this and that. And, and as just, he doesn't have that in him. C can you see what I'm saying? Right? But what happened is that we in our natural thinking, we get sucked into that issue of, wait a minute, what about me? What about me? What about me? You, you follow me? And right there is the open door for the offense. And bam, the life of Christ gets shut down. Why would, it get, why would that shut down the life of Christ? Because the very nature of that thinking is an op opposition to the life of Christ. The Bible says to be carnally minded is what? Death. That is carnal mindedness. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And the Bible says the, one who, the problem with the carnal mind trying to abide with the spiritual mind is that the carnal mind is what? Enmity against God. Is that a word? Can you see what I'm saying? But now... When someone begins to understand, as a matter of fact, before we fully understand that, even that kind of truth becomes somewhat offensive. It offends us. What are you telling me? You're finding fault in me? <laughs> are you smiling? Well, praise the Lord. All right. Anyway, let's pick up from where we were last week and continue. Is that okay? All right. Luke chapter 5. Hallelujah. Last week we were talking about the new man, God's design. And so we're going to continue there today. The new man and God's design part two. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. But let me, just, let me just back up a little bit because I, I, I love this picture. This picture of, of, of the new bottles and, and wine skin and stuff. Because, you know, I, like, I, I, try to do, I try to do a quick version of this recently. And it was okay. But it didn't come anywhere close to touching last week. <laughs> Amen. I know that was a quick version. And I believe one of the reasons why is because this introduction into that mindset of God's design is so wonderful. But then it is wonderful. The Lord gave it to me and I guess he gave it to me that I might use it. Amen. And you know I have a problem if I use it again and again. Okay, so Ma Ma Matthew, Luke. Where am I at? This is Mark. Luke chapter 5. All right, Luke chapter 5. Let's jump in the middle of it, and um, I'm going to just take verse 37. No man put it new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst, and the bottles be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. Now, God is smart, don't you think? So God did not even try to put his spirit inside of Elijah, Moses, or anyone in the old covenant. Because there will be, that would be like putting new wine into old bottles. And they would burst and the wine would spill. So God never attempted to do that. Amen? But what happens is that when we got born again and we got new bottles, then he put a new wine of himself and of his life and of his kingdom and of his nature inside this new bottle. Why was he able to do that? Because this new bottle was so designed by him... That it, that, it, that it had all the specifications. <laughs> is that okay? This new bottle that was designed is called the new man. And this new man has been so perfectly designed for what God intended. It has been so perfectly designed for the very presence of God and for God himself in all of his beauty, in all of his majesty, in all of his excellence, in all of his power, and all of his glory, and all of the consuming fire that he is to dwell in. Which is to say, all that God is, and in a way God is everything, all that God is, who he is, he is everything that he is in that new man. Who he is, who is he? Well, the more you find out about who he is, all that he is, he is in that new man. And that new man, that new bottle was designed to be able to, 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 to house him perfectly. Hence, the Bible says we're the temple of God. So, we were talking about what are some of these specifications, so to speak, in this new design. The Bible in Ephesians 2 verse 10 calls it, um, calls it, a new, calls it um, 
God's workmanship. And as Jesus says, so are we in this world. I'm just going to go through it very, very, very quickly. This new man is designed to hear. To hear and to not follow the voice of a stranger. This new man is designed to see. What I could not see in our ear here or the things that cannot enter in by the means of the five physical senses, God reveals them unto us by His Spirit. This new man has a, has a tremendous supernatural perception to be able to see what God is revealing and to hear what God is saying. And furthermore, to know. To know, not guess and wonder and maybe. To know. That is the reason why, because the Bible says... Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, For who knows the things of a man save the spirit of the man that is in him? Even so, no man knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know. So this new man knows. Now that is, that is so tremendously important. Because later on, not uh, later on in the weeks to come, I know in the morning services, where we're talking about, about, about interactions, the actions we ought to be taking with Christ. Later on, we're going to get to a point sometime in the very near future where we're going to talk about how, what are the criteria, what are the, uh, are, are the witnesses that God uses that we ought to be aware of to make sure we're not missing Him. Amen? And one of those, uh, and one of those things has to do uh, uh, with the fact that you need to talk you need to let the, 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 the new man on the inside, you need to let him discern. You need to let him judge. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 15 that he judges, he that is spiritual judges what? All things. That means he scrutinizes, examines, um, sifts it out. I, I mean, the, and he is able to distinguish accurately and recognize, oh, this might sound good, but that's not God. This might sound good. But this is an angel, this is, a, this is a, a, a demon disguised as an angel of light. This might sound good, this, v, this dream, this vision might sound good. However, it, it is not coming from the Spirit of God, it's coming from the flesh. And he is able to do that. But the reason why you can trust him and learn to look to him is when you understand that he knows. Amen? He, he sees, he hears, he knows. And the Bible goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, who had, had, who, had known the, who had known the mind of the Lord that he might instruct him? Who is it that God can sit down and counsel with that are going to be able to talk to him on his level? That could be able to say, God, you know what? I think this is what ought to happen. And God says, yes, you're right. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just paraphrasing, but that's 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Read it. Read it in many versions. But he says, who, who, had, who had known the mind of the Lord that he might instruct him? And then it answers, but you and I, we have the mind of Christ. Amen? There is an unction that you have received from the Holy One, and we know all things. 1 John 2, 20, 1 John 2, 27. Are you with me? But now the reason why these things are important is that when we recognize these, these specifications of this design and we begin to acknowledge it and we begin to speak it and we begin to declare it and we begin to confess it and we begin to believe it, then what happens, the more we speak and acknowledge that that is so, the more we become anchored in it. And when we are anchored, then we are no longer like a reed tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Are you, are you following me on that? But that anchorage is not going to come just because you get a revelation of it. That helps. That helps. In fact, that is very, very important. But the acknowledgement is like as to um, the doing of the word. The Bible says, if you abide in me, my word abide in you. Well, how does that happen? By acting on the word, not just having heard the word. If, all you, if you hear the word and don't act on the word, what happens? You step into deception. All right, so... Um, so this, 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 um, this guy is designed to know. When I know that he knows, then I want to talk to him. <laughs> I want to get information from him, don't you? Amen? And you start looking to, in a totally different place for revelation. You stop looking here. Amen? And, 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 and uh, this here, I've, I've, um, I know I've said it last week. I said it a few times since then, but it's getting sweeter every time I see it. First Timothy three verse fifteen, the church, how we are to behave in the church, the church of the living God, 
which is the ground and the pillar of truth. The church, which is his body. That new man is part of his body. And, as the, and, as the, and, and he is part, him and the head are one. The head is the truth and the body, the ground of truth. Which is to say that this new man, he knows, he sees, he hears, He's in such a perfect alignment with God. He has God's divine nature as his very own. This new man is the manifestation of truth. I didn't say that I of myself with my head not, not being straightened out yet and my soul having issues. I didn't say that I am the truth, but I am saying this new man. He is, and because I don't have enough courage to say it further than that, he manifests truth. And that's why if you could take him, that is the reason why, that, that was the reason why, for instance, we're we going to probably get to that today. How does he function in the midst of a crisis? How do people generally function in the midst of a crisis? Panic. They speak the crisis. They react instead of responding. But in the midst of crisis, he doesn't move, he's not moved. In the midst of the crisis, he's still expecting and believing that God is going to be glorified. In the midst of the crisis, he counts it all joy. You know why? Because in the midst of the crisis, he's acting like God. He's not looking at the things which are seen. He's looking at the things that are not seen. In the midst of the crisis, the truth remains the same. God remains the same. And as a result, he has a totally different mindset. And he's designed to function in the authority of God, the authority of the resurrection, the power of the resurrection. He sees everything reconciled to God through the cross. Now, I'm saying these things because these are the things our minds need to become renewed to, and then we need to begin to think that way, talk that way, become established in that. Amen? Now, is it normal Christianity? No, it's not. But is this what God has in mind? Absolutely. God said he had called us to this purpose. He has called us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Arm yourself with this mind. Amen? So he has a perfect design, and he's dedicated, devoted to the will of God. And this is something I also love, and it's worthwhile repeating a few more times. I mean, he is built with a capacity to never faint. He has the capacity to never faint. Faint. Say, I have the capacity to never faint. Say it two more times. I have the capacity to never faint. I have the capacity to never faint. Now, the I am talking about is a new man. Because, you see, we need to take on his identity as our identity because that's who we really are. Amen? Glory to God. All right, so let's, let's, let's pick up and go on from there. Um. The new man knows. Matter of fact, let's look at that. First Corinthians chapter 2, I quoted it, but let's look at it. First Corinthians chapter 2. Glory to God. The new man knows. Say, I know. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 12. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, the spirit of wandering. <laughs> we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know. We have received the spirit which is of God that we might know. Have you received the spirit of God? Well, then you should know. <laughs> that we might know. Know what? Things that are freely given to us of God. And then verse 16. For who had known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Listen to the Amplified on that. For who has known or understood the mind, the counsels, and the purposes of the Lord so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge? But we have the mind of Christ, the Messiah, and do hold the thoughts, feelings, and purposes of his heart. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that we can instruct God in the sense that there is something that God don't know. You know, one of the reasons is about for, to be able to pray in tongues is so that you can talk to God on His level. Well, from the mind of Christ, that's what you're able to do. Amen? And certainly, so this scripture says in Amplified, so as to guide and instruct Him and give Him knowledge. And that, yes, He can come and get with God, but I'll tell you, He can certainly give your head some knowledge. Amen? And when He, when he gives your head some knowledge, it's not just head knowledge. 
That's a plain word. It's revelation knowledge. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So what does he know? Well, the Bible speaks in first in, in Romans chapter eight about being carnally minded and spiritually minded. In first Corinthians chapter three, it says, Paul says, For you are carnal. The fact that you're arguing, and because there's so much strife and you're arguing as, uh, uh, as to who's of Apollos and who is of Paul, and, and, and he says, you, you are carnal. You, you're acting like mere men. You're acting like people that aren't even born again, like just mere men. Well, the new man is not like that. He is not a mere man. He has, he is, <laughs> he has God's divine nature. And he is not carnal, he is spiritual. That's why you got to understand his relationship with truth. Amen? And seeing and hearing and knowing. He is not carnal, he is spiritual. And he knows that life has nothing or of nothing to do, the truth of life is not determined by one's feelings and emotions. He don't judge on the basis of feelings and emotion. He judges righteously. Amen? So he knows that. That life has nothing to do with that. And I mentioned the fact about him being truth and he is, about him being light. Where we can accept the light because we have scripture that says ye are the light of the world. And that's your spirit man. He is light. And that is why in every situation God is desiring that you and I would, 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 would bring light into that dark place and, and so that now, let me quote it properly. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14 is what I'm referring to, where it says, How about God is working within, verse 15, working within us both to will and to do for his good pleasure, and that we must do all things without murmuring and disputing, that, he, that we may be blameless, harmless, that we would literally function as the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding forth the word of life, which is holding forth Christ. Hold that thought. Holding forth Christ. Hold that thought. Holding forth the life of Christ. Hold that thought. No, the record wasn't stuck. <laughs> In fact, we don't have that. If you say that nowadays, people don't know what you mean about the record being stuck. Because there is no such thing. <laughs> right? They have MP3 and P3M and CD, whatever. <laughs> No, but the record wasn't strong. I said that so as to put that out there. The life of Christ. The holding for the life of Christ. Because ultimately, that's what it's going to be all about. Later on, when we see how he lives, how he speaks, how he conducts himself, and recognize that, he's, that he is there to, uh, as a reconciler. Reconciling all men. Recon declaring unto men that God was in Christ. Reconciling them unto himself. When we see him as an ambassador. When we see him as a restorer of the breach. When we begin to see him as all these other ways in which he is to function. You will see that the sum total of it all is the holding forth of the life of Christ. It is letting the life of Christ come forth. And which is what the world is in desperate need of. Amen. Can you imagine you have freedom and you didn't know about it? Isn't that awesome? An awful thing. Can you imagine somebody's in prison and they've been set free and they don't know about it? Do you know God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself? Do you know according to what we sing at Christmas in Luke 2 and verse 14, peace and earth, goodwill towards men, do you know that there is peace between God and the earth, between God and men, because God was in Christ reconciling it? all of their trespasses and so on. Jesus paid the price for the entire human race. And therefore, there is no sin debt that is owed from the human race. Now, people will die and not receive Christ and, then, and then by not receiving the payment. All right, and then they're going to have to be judged. But as it is right now, Jesus took the judgment for the whole world. Amen? And the truth of the matter is, freedom and peace has already been purchased and paid for for every human being. Think about it. Freedom, liberty, Peace as purchased for the world, and, so, and, and, most of the, the, and a lot of the times the world don't even know it exists, much less the fact that it belongs to them. Think about that for a moment, and then you could see the reason for the church, then you could see the reason for our existence, and then you can understand what God wants to do in you and through you. And why it is, he says, be reckoned that we are to go as if God was, as if God was through us. It, it, as if God was through us. 
Um, how does it put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19? Beseeching as if God was beseeching the world through us, be reconciled. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them. Uh, no, no, no. Anyway. To wit. Anyway, to wit. It was, okay, the King James says, to wit. It was God personally present in Christ reconciling. I, I mean, looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm actually going, jumping forward a bit. Oh, oh, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. The point of the matter is, is that if we could, if we could become so alert to the life of Christ and God operating to us, you know how you ever seen a, you ever seen a little child act up? All right? You ever see a little child? Did you see a little child that, I don't know if you guys, you know, look at those, those little video clips, but there was a little child that, that, that threw a temper tantrum in the White House. Threw himself on the floor and carried on and so on. <laughs> and Obama just watched him. <laughs> but I'm not, sorry for the analogy, but it's like if we can just get a hold of God on the inside of us, God is like not acting up. It's like God is trying to rise up. In us, if we would let him, beseeching the world, through us, be reconciled. Freedom has already been paid for. And we need to awaken to that so that we can cooperate with that life that is within us. Amen? And it is in, that is why it is so important to understand these things. Because the more we understand, the more we meditate, the more we understand, then the easier it is for us to cooperate, which is what it's all about. It is about cooperating with the life of Christ that is in us. I like to call it interactions with Christ. All right? We have an interactive relationship. Interaction, action, action, action. All right? Jesus doesn't want us to spiritually just sit on our um, promises. <laughs> All right. He wants us to stand up and declare and proclaim and do and exercise and do the works of God. Amen? All right. So anyway, this new man knows. He knows certain things. He knows the truth. He is the light. He, 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 um, and, uh, uh, to the point, and, and he is so anchored, you know, you can tell how anchored somebody is when pressure comes, which is what the devil it counts, counts on. He is counting on the fact that when pressure comes for the word's sake, that you would wobble and become offended, right? And, and, and flip back into some selfish motivation. And as a result, him can stumble you and snare you. But this new man... This man is, that, that is God's perfect, that has been perfectly designed and fashioned by God, he is anchored so that even in the midst of a crisis, Christ will still manifest. In the midst of a crisis, he is still endeavoring for, for, for Jesus to be praised and magnified and glorified. Amen? Uh, you, you've, there, you, matter of fact, every now and then something will hit the news where a crisis did happen. And then you'll hear the testimonies that come out. That, 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 that is a witness to the reality of the resurrection and that person's relationship with God. What's happening there? It is that new man that was able to manifest, that was able to cause the life of Christ to manifest within, in the middle of the crisis and circumstances. And that's how it ought to be. He's always, always, always committed to God's will. We don't have time to turn to it, but 1 Peter 4, verse 1 to 3 is, is a passage we can look into sometime in the future. Personal gain to him. You know, you know how it says in, in Philippians, he count all things but loss? Now, Paul had come in such alignment and harmony with the new man that Paul, even in his natural thinking, and in his soul mind was so renewed that he had come to the place where he decided for me to live is Christ and to die is gain and I count all things but loss. The, even those things that were gained to me. Paul had come into that place of alignment. Amen. You know, that's why sometimes people want to talk about conscience. Conscience is, the conscience is not a sure guide. Why? Because some people's conscience are seared. However, Paul had developed his conscience in such a place that it was a sure guide. And he could have said, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Ghost, I lie not. 
But then that's because Paul, Acts 24, 16, had developed and had trained and had exercised his conscience to be void of offense, any selfish motivation in his relationship to God, void of offense in any, in, in, of any selfish motivation in his, in his relationship to man. And therefore his conscience had become so sensitive that it had gotten to such a place. Amen. His mind was so renewed that he had the mindset that even the things that were gain to me, even those things that were advantageous to me, even those things that were beneficial to me, I count them all but loss. It's easy to forget the things which are behind that were detrimental. But can you imagine forgetting the things which are behind that were beneficial? Hello? Man, that's... that's, that's Talk about, talk about, talk about having a, a focus where what's behind is gone and all I am doing is I'm focusing and I'm pressing for the mark and it's what ahead of me, what God got a hold of me for. That's, that's kind of wild. But that is the very essence of that new man and the way he's designed. So for him, the issue of personal gain is a, like, what are you talking about? So for him, because there is no issue about personal gain or personal loss, it don't mean nothing to him. So because of that, what is his mindset in a crisis? Because the reason why we have issues in a crisis is because of fear of personal loss. Whether it be loss of repetition, he don't care about repetition. Hello? The Bible says, let this mind be in you. <laughs> right? The Bible says Jesus made himself of no reputation and put up himself um, and took upon himself the form of a servant. All right, so I'm just trying to show you that this new man is spiritual. He's not carnal. That's a nice little picture of what spiritual is. Say I'm spiritual. I'm going to be spiritual. I'm not carnal. Right, there is natural, there's carnal, and there's spiritual. Amen? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at that. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, that's okay too. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 18. Of course, verse 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things, behold, all things are of God. Behold, all things have, have become new. Verse 18. And all things are of God. Who had reconciled. Now let's look at this. Let's look at this word reconciled. Who had reconciled us to himself. By Jesus Christ. And had given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit God. To wit that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And had committed unto us. The word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though, God, as, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he had made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in, in him. Would you think that the theme in here has, do you think this has something to do with reconcile? <laughs> Does it? Five times in just a few verses. When you look at it closely, you will see this assignment of reconciliation. And the new man is a reconciler. He reconciles people to God. He, 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 has, a, he has a mindset. He wants to restore what was destroyed. He is concerned about people's lives fulfilling God's purpose. Again, he's not consumed with himself, but he is consumed with you. He is consumed with other people's life fulfilling the purpose of God. Paul said something in Colossians chapter 1 and I believe verse 25. Let me just flip over there for a moment. Wherefore, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. He is concerned about the word of God being fulfilled in you. Think about that. You know, the Bible speaks about, about the love of God that causes us to prefer one another. Can you imagine an endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace? 
can you imagine if, if as, as a believer, if our concern for one another is, we are more concerned about what the Word of God is doing in your life positively than my own. And where I have, a, I have a, 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 a devotion and a commitment and a desire and a prayerful motivation to see the Word of God fulfilled in your life and to see your life fulfill God's purpose. Can you imagine if the body of Christ was consumed with that kind of mindset? Could that be what the Bible is talking about when it speaks about the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God? Come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God that we might be mature and come into the full stature of the measure of Christ. Could he be talking about that when he's talking about the unity of the faith? Good question. Only a question. <laughs> but this is his mindset. This is where he is at. You can see why if someone is in that position, you will see why the spirit of offense has no, you know, like Jesus says, the evil one coming, but he has what? Nothing in me. Well, how can the evil one turn this man into any selfish motivation which is necessary for the spirit of offense? He can't. You see, and that's the reason why he is in and of himself totally, completely good soil. Amen? He's a reconciler. But I want you to see, we were seeing what he knows, but now look at his heart. Look at where he is for people. He's a reconciler. And by the way, he's reconciling all things. He is not discriminating about who he likes and who he don't like. Now, as we see that, uh, we, 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 we might come back to that a little later. But you got to see that. In fact, we will come back to that a little, just, just, just shortly, to see some more about that reconciling. But just before I do, let us also recognize, that, as it says, God was within him, as if God, through him, was beseeching us, in verse 20. Be reconciled. In other words, then, it's like there is a life of Christ. The nature of Christ is like God working within, creating a motivation and a thinking process and an entire motivation that, that kind of comes out. Be reconciled. So it is ultimately the life of Christ that is in him that is operating through him. Remember when, I was, when the record got stuck over here? Hold for the life, hold for the life, hold for the life. Remember that? Right? Still stuck. <laughs> the life of Christ beseeching, operating through him, saying, be reconciled. So the one who is inside of him, whose nature he has, is the one that says, I have done this. I have finished this. I have paid this price. I have reconciled the world. Now I want them to have what I did. Can you see that? Because don't forget this man knows. He knows some stuff. He knows what has been done. He knows what is finished. He knows he has power and authority where the enemy is concerned. He knows he has access to the principalities and powers through, the, through Christ. He knows the authority in the name of Jesus. Amen? And the Bible says, just to confirm the fact that it is God that is rising up, beseeching, pleading through him. Philippians 2 verse 13 confirms, says the same thing. For God is at work within us, both to will and to do for his pleasure. Who's doing that? It is God that is doing it. It is the, now, now when you understand that, now let's back up again and look at him some more. Amen? Because he's this reconciler and this restorer, say restore. Now, when you think about the word restore, we think about restoring furniture. All right? We're finishing it. All right? And we strip this. And we try to get it back to what it looked like when it was new. But when God says restore, <laughs> he's talking about better than new. When God says restore, God is talking about his original intent, plan, and purpose. So when God says that we are to be restorers of the breach or restore pathways for people to dwell in, it doesn't mean to restore the pathways where they used to walk. Where they used to walk might not have been too good. 
He is talking about restoring them to the pathways that God had designed for them. It is not good enough for us to preach the word and to just, to, uh, 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 and to just try to give you some compromising stuff that might work. And No, we need to preach the word and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is what God has ordered. This is what God intends. And, and we need to go ahead and put the truth out there, not compromise it and make it seeker friendly. You follow me? All right. So God works is at work within him. It is, it is at work, it's God at work within him. Now understanding that and understanding the issue of restore, he restoreth my soul to what? When he has come, he will restore all things to what? Huh? To the original intent, the original plan and design. So, so now when you understand that his, 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 his as an ambassador, and it's reconciling. What is it about? Before, before, hold the word restore, original intent, and the word reconcile. The word reconcile, if you were to go to the Greek, actually has to do with exchange. He was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? So what happened is that the very nature of Christ that is energizing, that is working on the inside of him, that is moving on the inside of him to get certain results, understanding what has already been accomplished by the sacrifice of Christ, that nature is endeavoring to come to the world, to come to the one that is lost, to the one that is tormented, to the one that is confused, and exchanging their confusion and their turmoil and their torment for the life of Christ. Amen? It is not about a band-aid. It's not about just giving them a meal as much as that is important. Amen? It is about giving them the life of Christ. The nature of Christ. It is about them becoming born again. It is about being reconciled to God. Get this exchange in place. Are you with me? All right. That means where there is what would be his attitude when he comes and he sees pain and suffering. Hmm? He wants to exchange that for the, res for the life that, that, is, that belongs to them out of the resurrection. No wonder the heart of a missionary. No wonder the fact that we, we, we cannot be possessed by the life of Christ and not have some sense of, of, of evangelistic passion, which for, I know for myself and for, for the church is something that has got to be, that, that, that has to come forth from us. Amen? That it is from that place that the Paul says in Galatians 4 verse 19, how I travail again that what? Christ might be formed in you. Does that mean they weren't born again? They were born again, but Christ was not dominant in, in their thinking and in their soul area. So Paul was saying, I'm going to travail again. I'm going to pray this stuff through. I'm going to agonize until such time that you become so mature that Christ dwells in the rest of your being by faith. Amen? And that you would be rooted and grounded in him. So the nature that dominates him desires the reconciliation, which is to say, is to cause that exchange, their misery for his mastery. His peace for their turmoil and confusion. His healing for their brokenness and woundedness. Can you see that? No wonder when we get this out to Isaiah 61, which we're not going to get to, <laughs> It will say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he's anointed me to what? To preach what? Good news. Recovery of sight. Heal the brokenhearted. Set the captives free. I open the prison doors. Pour in the oil and the wine. Give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. And, and, then, and then it says those who receive it, they will end up in a place where their everlasting joy will be upon them. And I think that's where we should go next week. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, uh, actually, no, I think I, uh, okay, let me, I think I should stop right here because if I don't, then I got to open up a new area. So what have we seen? Just what have we seen at this point? And I, um, so there is this exerted, this person, this new man, and this is who you are. Has, there is this exchange, this reconciliation. Hence, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, it says we are ambassadors. 
We are ambassadors for Christ. What? Doing what? Bringing to the world a freedom and I, I, I mean a freedom that has already been paid for a freedom that they don't even know has been given to them. A freedom that they don't even know and a liberty they don't even know they have a right to it. Think about that. Do we have a message or not? They don't even know there is such liberty. They don't even know there is such freedom. They don't know that they can escape the limitations of, of the, that they could be in the world but not of the world. They don't know that they don't have to be bound in some place because of their race or their gender or their background. They don't know that there is a place of liberty where all that abuse that happened in their lives could be behind them. They don't know that. They don't know there's a freedom. They don't know there's a liberty. They don't know that they can have the mind of Christ. They don't know there's a peace which passes all understanding. They don't know there's a joy unspeakable and full of glory. They don't know that God has a cure when the world says there is no cure. They don't even know they exist. And then they, do, and they certainly don't know it's been paid for and they've got a right to it and it's free. <laughs> it's free. They don't have to pay for it. It's already been paid for. So that's our message. Be ambassadors of Christ. Go let the world know that they are reconciled. Go let the world know that an exchange has been taking place. Go and proclaim this good news, this good tidings of good things to come. Go proclaim this stuff. Hallelujah. Peace and earth, goodwill towards men. Isaiah 58, let's finish there. Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 and verse 12. Hallelujah. Isaiah 58 verse 12 says, They shall be of the, they shall be of the, hmm. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm just checking something here now and something just popped. Sorry. <laughs> I, I need to check this. Mm-mm. Mm. I just saw something I didn't quite see before. But anyway, we're here. Okay, let's, let's, let me just introduce it. Okay, Isaiah 58, Isaiah 61. I'm only going to introduce this, okay? But I just saw something here in Isaiah 58, verse 12. And this is where we're going to pick up next week. You see, this ambassador, this new man, this reconciler, this man impregnated with the nature of God, in whom God is mightily working to do certain things. This man that is God's design, he has a message. He has um, certain things and a standard, so to speak, that he lives by. There are certain things that dominate him. Isaiah 61 talks about that in the first three verses when it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel, etc., etc. Bind up the brokenhearted, pour in the oil and the wine, the oil of joy for mourning, etc., etc. But then what happens is, once he is able <laughs> to minister what he's got, once he is able to fulfill his own call and responsibility, once he is able, which is, and, and don't forget, his motivation is for that individual, for that recipient, for them to fulfill God's purpose. So as he fulfills his responsibility in getting them in line, getting them reconciled, then here's what happens. And in Isaiah chapter 6 to 1, reading from verse 4, it says what their experience will now become. All right? And they're the ones that are going to end up with an everlasting joy upon their heads. Now, Isaiah 54 is actually talking about the same thing. That they which receive this ministry, what's going to happen to them? Amen. Isaiah spoke about it in the context of they that, they that come to this place as a result of their fasting. Amen. They've received this ministry. So Isaiah 58 and verse 12 puts it this way. And they shall be 
of thee, they that shall be of thee, they that are going to be affected by the ministry of that new man of God's design, they are going to build the old waste places. They are going to raise up the foundations of many generations. They are going to find out that, wait a minute, is that what the Catherine Kuhlman and them used to talk about? Is that what Kenneth Hagin was walking in? Is that what has slipped away from the church? And they are going to, they are going to build. They are going to raise up those foundations. They are going to build to it. And they will be called the restorer of the breach. The restorer of paths to dwell in. Which is to say, now when we, now is that we are both people. We are the new man on the inside who has this ass assignment and is anointed, the anointing is in here, to do these things. But as these things are done, we too, when our outer man become recipients of it, we too begin to receive, the, uh, uh, come into the fulfillment of our purpose, and then we too. Uh, and that becomes duplicated in people. And then we are now able to go out and become the restorers of the breach. So here we are on the inside and on the outside having the fulfillment of it all. On the inside, we are already there. We are already anointed. On the inside, we are already have what it takes to bring, the, for, for, for the, for, to bring beauty, to give beauty for ashes, to proclaim certain things. And then as we ourselves get our minds renewed and get lined up, we will also become the restorers of the breach and, and building the old way cities and raising up foundations that had fallen and all kinds of good stuff. Amen? Say, say, say my, my future according to the gospel. Looks good. Looks really good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to stop here for now. Amen? Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord, Father. We pray. I pray for those here, those on the live stream, that they would awake under that new design. That is, let's stand. Let's make this confession together. Let's make this confession. Let's acknowledge some stuff. Say this with me. I acknowledge that I am who God has designed. And I am designed after the new man, after the image of Christ. I am designed. To hear him. To see what he reveals. I am designed to know. And have the mind of Christ. I am spiritual. Not carnal. I am anointed. I am sent by God. Anointed by God. To bring reconciliation. And to bring restoration. Where there was destruction, I bring life. Where there was confusion, I bring peace. Where there was sickness and disease, I bring health. I am responsible with the nature of Christ to see men, to, to, see, the, to see God's purpose fulfilled in the lives of people. In the name of Jesus. I am called to hold forth the very life of Christ, which is what this world desperately needs. That's my assignment. And I awake to it in the name of Jesus.